just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Hey everyone, this is not Leon. It's Andrew Parsons from Prologue Projects. I'm filling in for Leon while he's away. On this episode of 5 to 4, Peter, Rhiannon, and Michael are talking about the upcoming Supreme Court term. This term will include the usual attempts to curtail reproductive rights. The court will also take up a case that might challenge the principle of double jeopardy and hear a case about haddock, yes, the fish, that's of interest to everyone from Ted Cruz to the vaping industry. And while we don't know every case the court will hear this year, we've seen enough to conclude it's going to be another rough one. This is 5 to 4, a podcast about how much the Supreme Court sucks. Welcome to 5 to 4, where we dissect and analyze the Supreme Court cases that have rattled our civil liberties like repeated sacks rattling a quarterback's brain. Mm. I'm Peter. I'm here with Michael. Hey, everybody. And Rhiannon. Hello. And our friend, Chris Geidner. Hello. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you. Chris, for those who don't know, an independent legal journalist, publisher, and author over at Law Dork, which for my money, probably the single best place for law news right now. Yes. Wow. Thank you. And I mean that because I have other friends that do law news and I think their publications are worse. (laughs) Eat shit, Jay Willis. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to get a text five minutes after he hears that. (laughs) (laughs) No, but it's a great resource. It is. Yeah. Law Dork is excellent. It really is. Thanks so much. I forget if we're doing like a live stream on YouTube or like a Q&A with listeners or something at some point, but I recommended Law Dork. Peter and Rhiannon and I had never really spoken about it prior. And I was like, I subscribe. Like I'm a paid subscriber. And Peter was like, I am too. And Rhiannon was like, me too. Yeah. Where do you think I'm doing the research for these episodes, y'all? Duh. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. Some people think that we read the opinions as they come out. I just read Law Dork. I mean, hey, there are worse possibilities. (laughs) Literally many. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So... Today, we're going to do a little term preview. The October 2023 term is impending, and we thought we'd bring in Chris to help us walk through some of the upcoming cases. We'll be talking about LGBT rights, reproductive rights, the administrative state, criminal justice, all sorts of stuff. The court has, to date, accepted fewer blockbuster cases, I think, this term than the last couple of years. But there are still some big cases that might come to the court and perhaps are even likely going to come to the court. And we would be remiss not to cover those. And so I think we will start there. Chris, there are various cases concerning the constitutionality of anti-trans legislation that have been winding through the federal courts. Uh, We spoke with Aaron Reed a couple of months ago about some of these cases. You've covered them extensively at Law Dork. The court hasn't granted cert on any of these cases yet, but it seems inevitable that one of them will sort of in some form or fashion wind up before them. So I guess our question for you is, what's up with that stuff? You know, (laughs) what's that all about? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think you're right that we are right now at a position that it, it does seem Like sooner rather than later, we are going to get one of these cases before the justices. I might not have said that if we had had this conversation like two months ago, because Mm -hmm. at that point, there was sort of unanimity. Even Trump judges, multiple Trump judges have gotten these cases. Biden judges, Obama judges across the board. (laughs) Any district court judge who has heard a challenge to one of these bans has granted a preliminary injunction against the enforcement, at least of the hormone therapy bans that are contained in these bans on gender affirming care for minors. And so it did seem like as the summer was getting underway, particularly there was this day when federal judges in Tennessee and Kentucky both issued injunctions on the same day. And Mm -hmm. you all know how slow things move in federal courts when you get two injunctions from two different federal judges on the same day 
going the same direction. It sort of seems like things are reaching a consensus. And then enter Jeff Sutton. (laughs) Judge Jeff Sutton on the Sixth Circuit. He's the chief judge of the Sixth Circuit right now. In July, issued a ruling. He and Judge Amulthapar issued a ruling that put both the Kentucky and Tennessee bans back in effect. Mm -hmm. It was initially only for Tennessee. And then they heard oral arguments on the preliminary injunction on September 1st. And in the meantime, we also got another ruling from the 11th Circuit that was on the merits of a preliminary injunction that ruled 3-0 in favor of the Alabama ban Mm -hmm. and said, yeah, that's likely constitutional, despite the fact that no other judges had said so. And so the plaintiffs who are, to be clear, challenging this gender-affirming care ban, the trans rights activists actually have requested a rehearing and bonk from the 11th Circuit. That has been filed, and now we just have to wait and see if they're going to take it up. Right. What that means for when this goes to the Supreme Court, the Sixth Circuit case, we could be getting a decision there by the end of the month. And the 11th Circuit, we probably won't know whether they're taking it on banc until sometime in November, December, later. If, however, the Sixth Circuit rules by the end of the month that the Tennessee and Kentucky bans are constitutional, that could really fast forward things and get us up to the Supreme Court rather quickly if they Mm. decide not to try to go on bonk. And for our lay listeners, on bonk is when a decision is reheard with the entire suite of judges in an appellate circuit. So like every judge in the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals uh, will weigh in rather than just the typical three-judge panel. Yeah, normally when these cases go up, they start with three judges, but particularly when they're big issues, when they are key constitutional questions, something that the court has been split on before, they will hear it on bonk. There's also a procedural reason (laughs) in civil rights litigation why plaintiff's lawyers might try to go on bonk, and that applies here. It's when you won below, if you go on bonk, you pull the original three-judge decision. So in this case, what that would mean is that the injunction against Alabama's law would remain in effect while Mm -hmm. this goes on bonk. So like, if they do take it on bonk, that could be another year or so, or even longer by the time you get an actual decision. Because then you've got, I mean, you think in a normal case, you've got the three judges deciding in an on bonk, you've got eight, 11 more judges having to hash out opinions and footnotes and they're going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that could mean that that Alabama injunction could be back in place and and those kids in Alabama could be safe for another year before you had to have a ruling. That's right. That makes sense. Right. We wait with bated breath because who knows what Sam Alito thinks of the equal protection claim here. <laughs> womp, womp. And the thing that I did write about in writing about the Sixth Circuit is like Jeff Sutton has been here before. He was the judge on the Sixth Circuit who wrote the decision upholding marriage bans back in oh. 2014. Mm-hmm. He was the only circuit. The Sixth Circuit was the only circuit that upheld marriage bans after the 2013 decision striking down DOMA in Windsor. Right. And he basically said like, yeah, I get your argument, but we think democracy should be allowed to have the final say. And notably in the arguments on September 1st, that was how the Kentucky Solicitor General ended his arguments. Mm-hmm. He's like, mm-hmm. we shouldn't stop democracy here. The, right. the mm-hmm. states are engaged in a discussion. So it's entirely possible that Sutton could be writing another decision that will send an outlier that will lead this back to the Supreme Court again and do the Mm -hmm. same thing. Yeah. Yeah. But now we've got obviously a very different Supreme Court than we had in 2015. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure do. (laughs) All right. 
So sticking with the theme of other potentially catastrophic decisions that have not yet crept up to the Supreme Court, it wasn't long ago that there was extensive litigation about the legality of mifepristone Mm -hmm. and medication abortion. (laughs) Matthew Kaczmarek, a federal judge in Texas, provided a batshit ruling, Mm -hmm. basically saying post-dubs that mifepristone, no good. You can fully fucking ban it. (laughs) Yeah. And so there's a question of whether that case eventually winds its way up to the Supreme Court. So we'll go to our local reproductive rights correspondent, Rhiannon. In Texas, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Coming at you live. On location. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, uh, Peter gave a good summary here. Listeners, I think, will remember we've talked about this case before, and it really did make headlines when the ugly ghoul Matthew Kaczmarek came out with a ruling. He sits in the Northern District of Texas. If you'll recall, there was a lot of news around this case, too, and other cases that he's ruled on in the past couple of years that there is some judge shopping going on in Texas. Petitioners here challenging the FDA's approval of the drug mifepristone filed this very likely on purpose in the Northern District of Texas. They have a very, very, very high chance of their buddy Matthew Kaczmarek hearing this case. And Matthew Kaczmarek ruled just the way they wanted. So again, the issue is the FDA's approval of the drug mifepristone. That approval by the FDA happened more than two decades ago. These challenges, wonder why they're happening now. And, you know, a case like this could obviously have much broader implications for the pharmaceutical industry and the FDA's regulatory authority over lots of medications, right? So, yes, this is about reproductive rights. Yes, this is about mifepristone. This is also about, we talk about it a lot, the administrative state, right? The FDA's authority to do what it is assigned to do by Congress. So, Most recently, what has happened on this case, the Supreme Court has not accepted that it will hear this case this term. What's happened most recently is that a federal appeals court, so Matthew Kaczmarek ruled, that ruling was appealed by the Biden administration. So that means it went up to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. In that ruling, the Fifth Circuit upheld the legality of the pill upheld the legality of mifepristone, but really imposed a lot of restrictions on how mifepristone can be distributed, right? So the Fifth Circuit said, for example, that mifepristone cannot be sent through the mail, right? And also that it cannot be prescribed by telemedicine. This is really important even while they uphold the legality of the drug kind of in theory. De facto on the ground, people who need and are seeking abortions in banned states right now are often accessing medication abortion through telemedicine, getting those pills in the mail, right, from prescribers who are in other states where prescribing is not banned. So that Fifth Circuit ruling has been basically appealed again by the Department of Justice, right? So the Department of Justice, just a few days ago, as of this recording, has asked the Supreme Court to take up the case. So it remains to be seen. I don't feel good in my belly about the Supreme Court taking the case, but at the same time, just letting the Fifth Circuit's decision stand It's also completely untenable for millions and millions of people. The Department of Justice in their filing asking the Supreme Court to hear the case said, quote, for many patients, mifepristone is the best method to lawfully terminate their early pregnancies. They may choose mifepristone over surgical abortion because of medical necessity, a desire for privacy or past trauma. So up in the air doesn't feel good. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is important, the fact of how extensive this could affect the industry writ large, right. it's notable that Denko Laboratories, the maker of Mifeprex, is also one of the parties and they're represented by Hogan Lovells. And so we have both sort of like this combination power team of some of the best government lawyers and some of the like top corporate lawyers in the country fighting this. Mm-hmm. And they're fighting against Aaron Hawley. Yeah. Or, Yeah, Josh Hawley. Josh Hawley's wife. (laughs) Right. And just so our listeners know, Hogan Lovell's a big law firm with like a really ultra prestigious Supreme Court practice. Mm -hmm. 
notably the current home of Neil Cacio. Right. That's right. Burning Man survivor, Neil Cacio. <laughs> That's right. God knows what would have happened to that case had Neil Cacio died at Burning Man. <laughs> But we don't know for sure he's arguing it, right? No, he's, he's not. not. It's uh, Jessica Ellsworth and Kate Stetson is also on it. They know enough not to put Neil Catchall on the reproductive rights. <laughs> <seat>. <laughs> well, and that is something to note. Everybody has been putting forward. I mean, you've got Aaron Hawley yeah. arguing. She's not like the normal face arguing for Alliance defending freedom. Right. Well, Mm-hmm. which still makes me want to vomit saying right. that. She gets to do the, as a woman, I hate women thing. Right. God bless. Very effective. I just wanted to respond to something Re said about she doesn't feel good about asking the Supreme Court about this. I don't either. But both Roberts and Kavanaugh wrote concurrences in Dobbs, expressing, I think, in one way or another, some discomfort with how broad the other four conservatives were going with this. So assuming the Supreme Court does take this up, I think it'll be an interesting test for just how uncomfortable they are, right? Yeah, yeah. And what their limits are. Yeah. Optically, a huge opportunity for Roberts- Mm -hmm. And Kavanaugh. To reposition the court as moderate, right? To say, look, we're not just anti-choice here, right? Right. We're very nuanced on this issue. (laughs) Right. I sort of agree that there's- potential, especially with such a sort of obscene claim, Mm -hmm. you know, evoking a 20 year old FDA approval. Right. Exactly. The claim is so obscene that it really gives if I'm John Roberts, I'm looking at it sort of thinking like this is good PR in the making. Right. Well, I think they're right now hoping for a petition for cert because both of the petitions from DOJ and the government Now, because of the way the Fifth Circuit decided, they only have to address the later loosening of restrictions. The question is Mm going to be presuming ADF comes in and says, we think you need to decide based on 2000. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right. Like they then grant all of them and say, "Okay, we'll hear it all. And they can then say, oh, no, we're not wild. We're not going to upset the apple cart with how the FDA does this. but." We are going to get rid of the mail order because that was new and that was really a result of the pandemic. And they should have gone back to the old way once people were able to leave their house again. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Right. And just so our listeners have some clarity here, there are sort of multiple components here. One is the FDA approval from 20 odd years ago. The other is some later developments, including the mail order aspect. Right. right? So Mm -hmm. the court could theoretically address these things separately, even if they all come to the court at once. Yeah. 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 And before we move on, I just want to make one final thing clear for our listeners. Mifepristone is still available today. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court ruled back in April that until this case comes to a final decision, a final completion in the federal appellate system, Mifepristone is available today. Yeah. Yeah. And for checking on your own access or checking on the availability of Mifepristone wherever you are, you can go to Plan C. Pills.org. So we've talked about trans rights, LGBTQ stuff. We've talked about mifepristone and your right to reproductive choice. We're sure these are things that are on the minds of most of our listeners. The next big issue we wanted to cover that we're sure you're thinking about as well is the Magnuson Stevenson Act mm-hmm. and the requirement of private fishers to pay for monitors to monitor haddock (laughs) in the North Atlantic fisheries. Beautiful transition, Michael. Yes. (laughs) This is the big one. (laughs) I was going to suggest a transition about the administrative state, perhaps something like that. (laughs) No. Uh, No. But you went right to the haddock. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. Monitoring Atlantic haddock, more culture war bullshit. (laughs) Front and center, keeping our listeners up at night. What is going on with the haddock? This is clearly a Kavanaugh case. (laughs) Oh, maybe this is Alito. Maybe he fell in love with haddock when he was up on his... uh, When he was up in Alaska. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Mm -hmm. But I do think this case, Loper Bright Enterprises v. Raimundo, Remember that name, law students. You will be reading it in case books for sure. I do think this could be the biggest of the term, despite how ridiculous that sounds from those facts because of its implications for administrative law and the structure of American government. 
To that point, I wanted to read you guys a little list of all of the conservative foundations that have already filed amicus briefs in this case. Hmm. We have the Atlantic Legal Foundation and the Pacific Legal Foundation. Huh. One, two punch. And if you're missing middle America, we got the Mountain States Legal Foundation <laughs> and the Southeastern Legal Foundation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, so we got all the geography covered. Right. We got Chamber of Commerce and lower chambers of commerce, individual state chambers of commerce. We've got the Cato Institute. We got the Manhattan Institute. We've got the Goldwater Institute. If you want an institute named for a famous segregationist, Woo! we have the America First Legal Foundation. If you want one named for famous Nazis, <laughs> we've got them all. I do appreciate the Goldwater Institute because nowadays all the conservative institutes have these vague ass names. They're all here, man. <laughs> yeah. And so it's nice when they're just like the George Wallace Institute for legal change. Right, right. Yeah. And if you're like, well, this sounds all very businessy. Sure it is. We have NFIB, uh -huh. the group that challenged Obamacare. But we also have the Little Sisters of the Poor oh, good. who went after contraception. Those are like mean little snitch sisters, by the way. It's not regular. <laughs> <laughs> Gun Owners of America. Sure. Weighing in, sure. Why not? <laughs> Governor Kemp, nice. the U.S. House of Representatives, which is owned by Republicans. Ted Cruz, he's in here. Hmm. Everybody's here. It's a big conservative party. And the reason is this case is asking the Supreme Court to overrule a very old precedent, which created a doctrine that we call Chevron deference because uh, the case name was... Chevron, the National Resource Defense Council or something like that. And Chevron is a rule of statutory interpretation, but more than that, it's a statement about the court's place between the two branches of government. So yeah. when Congress creates an agency, they pass a law. It's a statute. We call them organic or organizing statutes. And the agencies can then use lawmaking power to pass regulations. And Chevron stands for the idea that when the court isn't quite sure if the agency is maybe exceeding its power, it tends to just give the agency the benefit of the doubt. If the statute's ambiguous as long as the agency's being reasonable. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. It's like any reasonable reading of the statute, they will sort of say, you know what, this is the two elected branches doing policy about. Yeah. North Atlantic Haddock, what the fuck do we know about any of <laughs> right. this, right? right? This is mm -hmm. not our place. And so we're just going to leave it to the experts, right? Congress delegated this authority to the experts so yep. that they can do what is necessary to affect Congress's goals, which in this case are conservation and the prevention of overfishing, which is a major problem in the North Atlantic right now with herring and haddock and all sorts of fish. And this is a real basic thing that all the conservatives want to do away with. Right. They want to reposition the court as the arbiter between the two branches, mm -hmm. which would create a large burden on Congress when it's trying to delegate authority to the executive branch in being very specific and very detailed, which the whole point of agencies is so that they don't have to do that, so that the agencies can handle the minutia. Right. So you don't need an act of Congress for every little thing that an agency does. Right. right. But the problem right. for the conservatives is that they know how to jam up the works in Congress, but there are all these agencies who can continue doing stuff even without further congressional authorization. Mm -hmm. And so they want to trim that back. And this is a longtime project of the right. Yeah. And it's one that Gorsuch has been a big fan of. We should assume right off the bat that we have at least four votes. Yeah who are going to be in favor of striking down Chevron deference. And I think it's worth noting here that we've talked about the major questions doctrine before, which is this idea that if Congress delegates a power of some sort to an agency and there's dispute over the scope of the agency's power, the court can basically ignore Chevron deference if it's a quote unquote major question, right. a question of major political or economic importance. And that has been the Roberts Court's kind of novel end run around Chevron deference. And this is basically them being like, why settle for an end run? Right. Let's just do away with it. Yeah. Right. 
we can just toss Chevron deference out. Sorry, I just remembered one more amicus brief that's been filed <laughs> on behalf of the electronic nicotine delivery system industry stakeholders. My goodness. Vaping. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> the vaping industry wants to get rid of Chevron <laughs> deference. Of course. They do not want to be regulated at all. That's right. So on the sort of same tack, the question of the administrative state. We should talk about CFPB, the Community Financial Services Association. The CFPB, of course, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, agency formed in 2011 with the aim of regulating predatory practices in the financial sector, like anything ranging from what happens at banks to payday lenders. It was part of Dodd-Frank, the Wall Street reform bill, right after the financial crisis, championed by Liz Warren, big thorn in the side of large banks. So, of course, there have been efforts to attack it in the courts from the very beginning. And this is a challenge that has been sort of notably successful to date. The CFPB has a unique funding structure where it receives funding directly from the Federal Reserve. The Fed gets its funding from bank fees. So the idea was to tie CFPB funding indirectly to the banks and keep mm -hmm. it slightly insulated from political maneuvering because the funds aren't subject to congressional review on an annual basis. Right. Now, the claim here is that the funding process is itself unconstitutional because it violates the appropriations clause of the Constitution. The appropriations clause says, quote, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. And that's all it says. So the Fifth Circuit said, yeah, that's not an appropriation, actually. It's something else. Mm -hmm. They didn't say what exactly that is, but it's in their mind, it's not an appropriation. <laughs> and the CFPB said, look, Congress passed a law right. that provides for an amount of money. It provides for where that money comes from. Isn't that an appropriation? Right. What's this distinction here? Mm -hmm. Right. So this could be a chance for the court to basically abolish the CFPB either outright or functionally by saying it needs to be subject to review by the Congressional Appropriations Committee, which would basically be a guarantee at this stage that its funding gets kneecapped. It's also a threat to other agencies with non-traditional funding structures, like the Postal Service gets its funding from postage, for example. If you're doing your analysis like the Fifth Circuit, that's not an appropriation, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Also, the Fed itself, right? It would be weird to say that the CFPB's funding, which is derivative of the Fed's funding, is unconstitutional, but the Fed's funding is somehow fine. <laughs> so, worst case scenario, end of the Federal Reserve and like the weird libertarian <laughs> gold bug guys are now in control of our government. That's worst case. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one other case. They're going to revalue the Iraqi dinar. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> the rise of Bitcoin starts with this case. Here it is. Yeah. <laughs> they told us. We didn't listen. There's one more case threatening to unwind some post-2008 reforms, SEC v. Jargacy. As of now, if the SEC finds that someone has violated the law, they can sue that person in federal court or much more likely they can bring an enforcement action against them in what is called an agency adjudication, which is basically just like an official arbitration within the agency. Mm -hmm. Dodd-Frank made this much more feasible. And in right. recent years, most SEC enforcement actions have been through agency adjudication. This case has challenged those proceedings, saying that perhaps they violate the Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial and or the non-delegation doctrine, another administrative state issue. Mm. So we don't need to get into the details on this one, but it's not out of the question that the court defangs two post-2008 reforms mm. all in one term. Yeah. And we go back to 2007. Yeah. Right. And it is important to think about the fact that the non-delegation doctrine was basically not dead letter law, but was not something that that we were talking about a lot. Mm. But Gorsuch has taken some time and like side opinions uh, on some of these major questions doctrine cases to basically explain that the non-delegation doctrine, which is a constitutional clause, is the underlying yeah. 
who is the what's it rationale that justifies the right. major questions doctrine. Right. So these are related. Right. right. The major questions doctrine might be subsumed by whatever rule they create when they end Chevron deference, if they end Chevron deference. Right. And that might look a lot more like what Gorsuch calls the non-delegation doctrine. Who knows? I try not to speculate about such things uh, other than to predict every year that it will be back. <laughs> yes. And it's it's worth noting that like all these cases are like very extreme and all these questions are very extreme. So it's possible that they overrule Chevron but generally leave CFPB intact and yeah. the SEC intact, that would still be radical, right? Yeah. Right. The right wing going one for three would still be a radical departure right. from the status quo and a remaking of the government, as would just trimming the CFPB's sales rather than outright saying you're no more yeah. or, or whatever, right? Yeah. Like yeah, there yeah. are a lot of things they could do here that would be less than what's being fully asked of them right. that would still be extremely right. radical. It's something they've been building towards with the major questions doctrine, with these extra concurrences talking about the administrative state. It really feels like this is going to be a big sea change that's coming on the horizon one way or another. Yeah. yeah. All right. Transition? Uh I don't have, I don't have a good. This is this is again where I ran out of good transitions. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about criminal law. Yeah, let's trade transition to something lighter <laughs> yeah. than the yeah. remaking of American government. Let's hear from our criminal law correspondent. <laughs> <laughs> Coming at you live in Texas. <laughs> um, yeah, I do want to talk about a couple of criminal law or at least criminal law adjacent cases. But actually, these two cases that I'm about to talk about, it's actually not super clear to me and Chris and you two clowns. Uh, I, I'd love to hear what y'all think as well. But it's not super clear to me that these two cases will come out terrible. Mm -hmm. So this might be a little bit different from the administrative law cases that we just talked about. These are two that I am personally interested in and definitely keeping an eye on. So first, let's talk about civil asset forfeiture. This case is called Cully v. Marshall. Civil asset forfeiture, we talked about this in our episode back in 2020. 32 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, decades ago. Mm -hmm. But this is the practice, civil asset forfeiture is the practice by which law enforcement takes people's property, forfeits their ownership of their property, even without proof that the person they're taking from is guilty of any crime, right? right? This happens across the country in states. The federal government does it too. Basically a massive scam by which law enforcement literally generates billions of dollars nationwide for itself every mm -hmm. single year. Now, generally, because the government can't take property from you without due process, there has to be some sort of legal proceeding to determine whether the police have seized your property legally. And if it really is at least related to a crime, even though you might not be guilty of the crime. Right. And because of due process, a person can contest the forfeiture of their property. Right. They can present legal arguments for why the forfeiture was not legal. But the way states and the federal government effectuate civil asset forfeiture in a lot of cases is that that process that they give you, theoretically, those processes can be really, really onerous and difficult and expensive, right? The government uses all manner of tactics to deter people from fighting the forfeiture of their property. And many times people just end up giving it up, right? Like they just took my car. I don't have the money to hire an attorney to argue for me. I don't know what I'm supposed to say when I go to court and appear before the judge. People just give up their property because these processes are so difficult. For example, state and federal rules can require that a person show up to multiple hearings to fight the forfeiture of their property. The process can take forever, literally years. Mm -hmm. So we know from cases like Bennis v. Michigan and decades of jurisprudence on this, the Supreme Court has allowed civil asset forfeiture, right? They've greenlit it. We have a whole episode about it. But this case, this term, Cully, at the Supreme Court is about one of those deterrence tactics that law enforcement and governments use to make fighting forfeiture of your property basically impossible, which is those delays, the government delaying the process and what rights people have to their property while the forfeiture case is ultimately decided. 
So briefly, let's talk about what happened in Alabama. This case is two consolidated cases out of Alabama. Two women were the victims of civil asset forfeiture. Both had their cars seized by the cops. One had lent her car to a friend who was arrested while driving the car, and the cops found that he had meth in the car. The other lent her car to her son, who got arrested for marijuana possession. Both of these women were the owners of their cars, and they had absolutely nothing to do with these crimes. They had no knowledge that the people they lent their cars to were doing anything illegal, right? Still, even though they have what's called an innocent owner defense, Alabama took over a year in one case and almost two years in the other case to finally have a hearing where a judge was like, oh, yeah, the person who owns this property, the person who owns this car had nothing to do with this crime. So, yeah, they get their property back, right? Mm -hmm. Side note, Alabama says that it gives people a right to their property while the proceedings are pending, while they're taking two years to ultimately decide these cases. They say they give people a right to their property. That right is that the state requires the owner to pay a double value bond Hmm. to get their property back while they are waiting for the decision. That means you must pay double the value of your property to use it for the year you are waiting for the court to decide if they can finally take your property from you. That's smart. And then Alabama invest that in Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, this case at the Supreme Court is narrowly actually about what legal test has to be used to determine whether a person gets a quick hearing about whether or not they can retain their property over the course of the proceedings. But I think it's an interesting one to watch because after the Supreme Court has given a green light to civil asset forfeiture in cases like Bennis v. Michigan, Now people across the country are getting absolutely bulldozed and the Supreme Court is now tasked with retroactively, like, how do you patch up Mm -hmm. this awful breaking of a dam? Right. Right. Like, what does due process really require? And, you know, you wonder if it's too little too late, really. And, you know, to Ree's point about these might not turn out as bad as we think about six years ago, the Supreme Court in 2017 turned back a challenge to Texas's civil asset forfeiture law. And Justice Thomas wrote one of his opinions we've talked about on our Thomas episode, his sort of like, I'm just thinking out loud here. My, yeah. uh, here's my half-baked thoughts. I'm not sure. Where he sort of just ruminated on the possibility that asset forfeiture is unconstitutional, mm-hmm. just blanketly. Yeah. And I think this is something that appeals to a lot of the sort of libertarian right, like some of the People I mentioned, uh, you know, that yes. are coming after Chevron, like Cato Institute and stuff, are they're not right. fans of it. Yeah, yeah. So this is definitely an area where we might get a quote unquote good ruling from the court or at least a less bad one. When I think it's also a step further than that. Oftentimes these cases, the ones that go well are the ones brought by. It's either brought by Institute for Justice yes. or right. one of the various. Right. X legal foundations. I mean, normally Pacific legal foundations. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And yes. IJ's behind this one. Right. Um, IJ actually has a really good report that they've updated almost yeah. yearly for a while called Policing for Profit that is about civil asset forfeiture. People should check it out if they're interested. Yeah. Moving to another case, this one about criminal procedure and specifically double jeopardy. This one is interesting because it really does have potentially massive ramifications for really foundational concepts in criminal procedure. But I don't even know if I want to say that I'm cautiously optimistic (laughs) because the change would be so massive to this, you know, sort of foundational concept of double jeopardy. You know, but that said, I feel like I know where Clarence Thomas is on this and that's not good. (laughs) But um, maybe everybody else, maybe the other conservatives take a little pause. This is not one of the two things that Clarence Thomas is good on. Right, right. Exactly. (laughs) So double jeopardy, widely known concept, right, in criminal procedure that people probably understand, like maybe kind of broadly to mean that you can't be tried twice for the same crime. But it's not quite that, right? (laughs) Rules can be a little complicated about when double jeopardy applies and when it doesn't. There are legal tests for figuring that out. There are Supreme Court cases about double jeopardy. But actually, the most fundamental double jeopardy rule is that an acquittal cannot be changed. You cannot be tried again if you are found not guilty of a crime, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes legally in explaining this concept, you might hear the word inviolate, right? An acquittal is final. It cannot be changed. It cannot be marred. 
If you have gotten to the stage of a jury or a judge handing down a verdict and the verdict is not guilty, double jeopardy applies. You cannot be tried again. This is old, old, old. Like Mm -hmm. you want to talk about conservatives going back and like looking at like history and tradition on stuff. Mm -hmm. This is a very old concept back from like the English common law. It doesn't matter. I just want to emphasize. (laughs) It does not matter if the person is actually guilty of the crime. It does not matter what reason a jury has for finding a person not guilty. If they find a person not guilty, you cannot be tried again for the same crime. Except. (laughs) Except in Georgia. (laughs) Except there's this fucking case out of Georgia (laughs) where the Supreme Court is taking up this question. So Damien McElrath was prosecuted by the state of Georgia for three crimes that come out of the same incident. There's three charges, malice murder, felony murder, and aggravated assault. Now, the jury found McElrath not guilty by reason of insanity on the first charge but they found him guilty of felony murder and aggravated assault. Now, those verdicts are legally sort of like inconsistent, right? If somebody is found to be legally insane, it means, this is a very, very basic explanation. If somebody is found to be legally insane, it means that they were incapable of knowing right from wrong or they were incapable of having the intent to do the crime. They couldn't have even meant it, right? Right. So... If the jury found McElrath not guilty by reason of insanity on one charge, that would generally mean he would be not guilty by reason of insanity on the other charge. Because they're all stemming from the same facts. Right. Same incident, same facts. Right. Yeah. So if he couldn't mean it or if he didn't know right from wrong on one charge, it kind of indicates that legally it seems like it would apply across those verdicts. Right. Right. So McElrath, through his attorneys, is the one who appeals this decision. He says, basically, if I was not guilty by reason of insanity on one charge, my convictions on the other charges should be vacated. The state of Georgia, the prosecutors themselves, don't fight that not guilty verdict on the one charge at all. But the Georgia Supreme Court vacates all of the verdicts and said all of them need to be retried. This is double jeopardy 101. He has been found not guilty. By whatever reason the jury had. No, this is 102, baby. New rules. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Double jeopardy should indicate that he cannot be tried again on that one charge, right? Right. They could go again for the aggravated assault and the felony murder. Felony murder. Right. You could keep doing those over and over again, but once someone is acquitted, it's done. Done deal. Right. No, that's fun. I think we should be exploring (laughs) getting rid of all of the things that we learned like the first week of law school. Right. Reasonable person standard. Trash it. Chevron deference. Get fucked. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Tears of scrutiny. God. (laughs) Yes. Well, that one might be good. (laughs) So this would just represent such a massive departure from the understanding of double jeopardy foundationally, right? It's genuinely hard for me to see that the court says that the state of Georgia can try him again on the one that he was found not guilty on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk Second Amendment. Mm. Chris, I'll hand this over to you because basically I feel like the background here is a couple terms ago, the court said under the history and tradition test that they have concocted, New York's gun control regime was unconstitutional. And since then, in the lower courts, there's been all sorts of fighting over different gun laws with people trying to figure out, are there historical corollaries for these laws that we can point to or no? And the whole process and practice has been so ridiculous that many judges who clearly think that the Bruin decision was preposterous have sort of started to like very openly throw up their arms and say, I'm not entirely (laughs) sure what to do with this. And Rahimi seems to be the case where everything has come to a head in the darkest possible form. Uh, So I I will let you describe the case. Yeah. If we were trying to create a sort of like Frankenstein's monster, here's the worst case scenario of what Clarence Thomas is doing Mm -hmm. to the country, this is it. Yeah. This is the federal law that says it's 18 U.S.C. 922, and there's a provision that says if you are subject to a court order that was issued after a hearing that you received actual notice, so we don't have some due process issue here, 
that restrains a person from harassing, stalking, or threatening an intimate partner or a child of that intimate partner. It is found that they represent a credible threat to the physical safety of that person, that they cannot basically have a firearm that has been involved in interstate commerce. Right. This is a law that protects people who are faced with domestic violence from their partner being able to have a gun after a restraining order has been issued against them. Right. Right. Enter our best friend, Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. <sighs> the Fifth Circuit has for a long time been a place where bad things happen, where liberals have been afraid. Yes. But now, truly, like, you do this, how bad can the panel get? Oh, it can be worse. Right. And we talked right. about these three judge panels earlier, and now we get these situations where, like, the good old days of Edith Jones <laughs> aren't the problem anymore. Now we have multiple Trump appointees. You can have panels that have majority Trump appointees. And that's what happened here. And we had both James Ho and Corey Wilson on this panel with Edith Jones. And Corey Wilson wrote the decision. And what he said is that the question presented in this case is not whether prohibiting possession of firearms by someone subject to a domestic violence restraining order is a laudable policy goal. The question is whether that statute I just read you is constitutional under the Second Amendment in light of that Bruin decision. Three words. It is not. Oof. Ugh, that God. was the Fifth Circuit's decision. And the Supreme Court took up this case. The Biden administration asked the Supreme Court to take the case. We had this Fifth Circuit ruling. Yeah. It was as bad as it gets. And that applied then to Texas, to Louisiana, and to Mississippi. Right. And so the federal government was like, we can't let that stand. And they asked the Supreme Court to hear it. And they filed their brief. Right now, we're not going to get... Rahimi's brief until later this month, but I just wanted to read from his argument against the Supreme Court taking the case. Rahimi said, don't take the case, let that Fifth Circuit decision stand. And this is the history and tradition test at play. Mm -hmm. What he argued as the reason for the Supreme Court not to take the case is that the plain text of the Second Amendment clearly covers the conduct prohibited by the statute. And so the government bears a heavy burden here to affirmatively prove that the regulation is part of the historical tradition that delimits the outer bounds of the right to keep and bear arms. And the burden is even heavier, he writes, because it addresses a general societal problem that has persisted and yet, quote, no one attempted to disarm domestic abusers as a class during the first two centuries of our nation's existence. Woof. So because we let men beat their wives. Yeah. Right. This is the legal argument. Right. This is not even me like bullshitting here. Like, right. This yeah. was his actual argument that because we allowed men to beat their wives. In the early days of this country, this statute should be found to be unconstitutional. And even further, he was actually arguing the Supreme Court shouldn't even hear the case on this basis. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, again, like, huh, we don't want to make any. That's what's going to happen on this case with this course and in this light of this history and tradition test. But like, mm -hmm. this is as bad as it could get. And so I do think, again, we talk about like, oh, here's a chance for the court to really get some good public points by finding some limits to this history and tradition test that allow us to uphold a ban on domestic violence abusers having guns. Right. Yeah, not just the good PR. There's also the real risk of bad PR, yes, right? Yes, like the first right. time someone kills his ex-spouse 
with a gun that he was only able to get because of the Supreme Court decision. And people say, yeah, he only had this gun because of this Rahimi decision. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The Supreme Court doesn't want their name next to a murderer's name in the news. Right. So they might trim the Fifth Circuit sales here. But I don't know. Yeah. It's hard to know at this point. I have a very hard time believing that they would strike this law down. I'm mostly interested in what fucking knots they tie themselves into trying to construct a test right. yeah. or an application of the test where the law is upheld. Yeah. My best guess is that they uphold it and that it's like an incredible reach. Yeah. There's no other way to for them to come out of this unscathed. And I think it won't be a one ticket only. They're going to find some limitation on domestic. They're going to yeah. find some way that they're not giving free reign to New York and Illinois yeah. and these right. other cases that are working their way up. Yeah, yeah. Let's take a break. We're back. All right. So that's the next steps for the Second Amendment. Let's step back and think about the Roberts Court's body of work. They've attacked the rights of Muslims, black and brown people, immigrants, LGBTQ people, women, the poor. If you're a reactionary psychopath, you have to step back and think whose rights have gone insufficiently trampled. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and if you said people who need accommodations due to physical disabilities, some assholes in the defense bar seem to agree with you <laughs> because there is a case called Atchison Hotels v. Lawfer. The Americans with Disabilities Act requires that places of public accommodation, meaning like retail stores, hotels, any business open to the public, take reasonable steps to ensure that their space is accessible to people with disabilities. Now, the way that cases under this part of the ADA are brought is generally through what are called testers. Law firms will contract with an individual who is a quote unquote tester and whose job is essentially to go from business to business looking for ADA violations. And if they find them, they will sue. It should go without saying that businesses have always hated this and it's become more contentious in recent years because of regulations saying that hotels need to list their ADA accessibility features on their websites, which allows testers to just go website to website looking for violations. So this hotel chain got sued and then they said, hey, this person doesn't have standing to sue because they never actually intended to stay at our hotel. They're just going website to website, right? Mm -hmm. And that sort of violates traditional notions of standing. They weren't going to use what we are offering. And this is sort of a big deal because it's possible that the court basically says, yeah, this sort of structure for attacking the ADA is not allowed. You need standing. You don't have standing here. That's a big deal because without testers, ADA enforcement basically drops down to zero. The court could very easily say here, this sort of structure for bringing lawsuits under the ADA is not allowed. These people don't have standing. You need standing. That is a huge deal because without testers, ADA enforcement basically drops to near zero, right? The way that this would work otherwise is that a layperson who is using a space or a website would have to themselves identify an ADA violation. And I know that might sound easy, but you know we're not generally talking about, oh, this place doesn't have a ramp and they need a ramp. We're talking about much more subtle, nuanced issues. Right. So without testers, enforcement of the ADA, pretty difficult, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I also want to point out that the hotel and the defense side here tries to make it seem like this is some big lucrative grift. Mm-hmm. That litigating these cases is like, yeah, you you just make massive amounts of money on it. Right. And it's like they're scamming the court system. Right. These testers are just running around looking for problems and suing, right? Almost like it's some kind of slip and fall thing. Right. In reality, there's like no big cash award in these cases. You only get two things if you win. Right. One, they fix the accessibility issue. Two, attorney's fees. So what happens functionally in almost all of these cases is they just settle right away. Mm -hmm. You find out about the violation. You say, all right, we'll fix it. We'll pay your attorney's fees to date. And that's that, right? It's not some big money-making operation. Literally no one 
is getting rich off of this. So we'll see what the court does. It's interesting primarily because one of the themes of last term was the court going to obscene lengths to find standing for right-wing plaintiffs. Right. Yes. And so it sort of makes sense that as a natural extension of that, this term will be about them doing the complete opposite <laughs> for a progressive plaintiff. Right. So that does feel like where this is going, frankly. Yeah. And we talk about standing. We talk about how the court has treated standing. But like, these are real people. Like, they might not be on their way to the hotel, but they are hired by firms who do this work, who know what accessibility is required and their real problems that they identify because right. they, they wouldn't win their cases otherwise. Right. So, I mean, having just come out of a year of covering 303 Creative, where this person who had never made a wedding website was allowed to create an exemption to state's non-discrimination laws, it seems like, I mean, I know I'm going to get a laugh from all of you. It would be the height of hypocrisy for this court <laughs> to find yeah. that there's no standing here yeah. if it's Coach true. Kennedy had standing yeah, absolutely. two right. years ago in the prayer case. And right. if, what are you talking about? He was literally standing in the picture. <laughs> there was a photograph. Yeah. It's real. <laughs> Yeah, hypocritical, but that's our bread and butter, Chris. <laughs> Kennedy didn't even live in this state anymore. And he was like, no, I intend to come back and coach, coached one game and then quit. Yep, just a couple weeks ago. Right. Look, the reality of this is that like this whole system, this like tester driven, law firm driven system is basically due to the lack of regulatory oversight. Right, because we don't have like an OSHA or something that will go do checks right. for this. Exactly. If there were an agency body that had funding that could go around checking retailers and checking websites and taking complaints, then everything would be on the up and up. But since that won't get funded, we're stuck with this sort of like makeshift sort of like pseudo regulatory apparatus, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Where what's basically happening is that this is sort of like substituting for a system where a violation is spotted and they get fined, right? The attorney's fees are like the fine that you hand over for your violation. Right. That's what's basically being replicated by these testers and attorneys. And so what I feel like is quite likely to happen here is that they scrap this sort of like privatized agency that the government has sort of necessitated by failing to fund enforcement for the ADA and we're left with nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> So, Chris, one other thing we wanted you to talk about, because you've sort of covered this on Law Dork, is the ongoing drama with voting rights in Alabama. Of course, our like lone win this year <laughs> was Allen v. Milligan, where the court sort of allowed the Voting Rights Act Section 2 to remain. <laughs> and not only that, but told Alabama, you have to create, under the Voting Rights Act, another majority-minority district. And... Alabama has been intransigent, shall we say, yeah. to this point. And it has raised questions about defiance of the Supreme Court across the political spectrum, et cetera, et cetera. So what is happening in Alabama is really my question to you. Yeah, I mean, we got this ruling in June and there was a strong reaffirmation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which was the thing that we were told when... Section 5 was this preclearance provision that was struck down in mm -hmm. Shelby County that was basically before the problematic states could make voting rights changes, they had to get approval. Mm -hmm. Right. That's been gone. Right. But we were told by John Roberts back when Shelby County came down that you'd have Section 2 that allowed outside people to sue after changes were made. And that's what happened here when Alabama tried to do redistricting. They lost. They were told that there was vote dilution, that the voting rights of black Alabamians were diluted and that they needed two opportunity districts, districts where black voters would have the opportunity to elect a candidate of their choosing. And right. Alabama went up to the Supreme Court with that. They said, we think that that's wrong. And they sort of suggested that Section 2's vote dilution argument should be tossed out, and they lost. And so what did Alabama do this summer? They 
passed another map that only had one <laughs> yeah. uh, majority black district yeah. and said, we're fine going back to court again. This is good. Why not? Yeah. And the court, which these are heard before a three judge panel of district court judges, they are really mad. They heard arguments over this and they honestly were like, you've got to be kidding us. Yeah. Right. And affirmed their earlier ruling. They said this still violates Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And so what did Alabama do? <laughs> they asked for that to be put on hold while they go back to the Supreme Court, while they go back to the 11th Circuit. And what we got this week the day we are recording this was another decision by this three judge panel saying we repeat that we are deeply troubled that the state enacted a map that the secretary readily admits does not provide the remedy that we said federal law requires. Mm -hmm. They said the law requires the creation of an additional district that affords black Alabamians like everyone else a fair and reasonable opportunity to elect candidates of their choice, period, without further delay, period. Mm -hmm. So the three-judge panel is set on what's happening. Right. It is pretty clear that Alabama is going to go back to the Supreme Court. They're yeah. trying yeah. to make this be delayed long enough that they can get this out of 2024. Yeah, yeah. They're trying yeah. to get this held up so that they can have their current shitty map last one more election cycle. Right. right. I think that they're going to lose. Yeah, it does feel like they're going to lose. And this is a rare moment where <laughs> what had happened, the reason why the one district map went into effect for the last election was because Chief Justice Roberts joined the liberal appointees, but Kavanaugh joined the conservative majority saying we'll let them put their bad map in place for this one election. But he was the switched vote this summer. He went with Roberts and the rest of the majority in saying, reaffirming the Voting Rights Act and affirming this district court ruling that said that there needed to be two majority black districts. And so I think we could get a, a pretty strong order from the Supreme Court that says, like, cut out your bullshit. Yeah. And a special master had already been appointed to be drawing maps. And the special master is supposed to have a map done before the end of the month. And so I think this is going to go up to the Supreme Court, maybe on the shadow docket. But I think Alabama is going to lose and I mm -hmm. think it's going to be pretty quick. Yeah, that sounds right. I'm curious about whether we could do something remedy wise along the lines of holding the entire Alabama state government in contempt. <laughs> <laughs> I think that they're going to get away with basically having forced the court to do this. Yeah, right. yeah. But I don't think that they're going to get away with using a one black majority district map, but I do think they're going to get away with the way that they sort of subverted the system mm -hmm. right. and forced the courts to do for them what they weren't willing to do and should have done under the court's orders. Yeah, right. We're rounding the bend here, and I think our episodes are never complete <laughs> before we talk about the issue of ethics. That's right. <laughs> The last episode was a premium episode, and we updated everyone on the Thomas and Alito disclosures. And then somehow more happened. Yeah. Incredibly. It never ends. The fun never stops. <laughs> the merry-go-round just keeps on going. Mm -hmm. So the big story we want to talk about is Justice Alito. Our dedicated listeners will probably remember that after Dobbs, he was granted an interview by the Wall Street Journal, by an editor at the Wall Street Journal, James Toronto, and a private lawyer, David Rivkin. The uh, headline for that interview is Justice Samuel Alito, colon, open quote, this made us targets of assassination, end quote, about the leak of the Dobbs opinion. Later, more recently, after Alito's name became a little 
public because of ethics indiscretions and being the subject of a ProPublica piece. He got a second interview again by Toronto and Rivkin, this one titled Samuel Alito, the Supreme Court's Plain Spoken Defender. Um, <laughs> what a good guy. Yeah. Sarah, plain and tall. <laughs> These are the definition of puff pieces, which, you know, the, the Wall Street Journal also let him post essentially a blog in response to. Well, not in response, exactly. Yeah. To, yeah. Not in response to preempting the ProPublica piece, knowing it was coming out. I want to remind folks of the timeline here because I think it's crucial yeah. to understanding his relationship with the Wall Street Journal. Yes. ProPublica was writing a piece about some ethics concerns with Alito. They call him for comment, being like, hey, fucking remember being on a, uh, a, a all-expenses-paid trip to Alaska? Mm -hmm. With billionaires? Paid by uh, Harlan Crow. Remember hunting the most dangerous game with your billionaire friend? <laughs> <laughs> Where you hunted human beings? <laughs> <laughs> I do have to interrupt here. You got your billionaire to justice chart wrong. It wasn't Harlan Crow. It wasn't, it wasn't Harlan. Harlan. It was yeah. Singer. That's right. It was right. Paul Singer. Look, every justice gets assigned a billionaire if you're a conservative. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's hard to keep track of them. You Sorry. have daddy billionaire. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And then before the piece comes out. He said no comment. Right. He said no comment. And before the piece comes out, he goes to the Wall Street Journal, asks them if he can front run the piece with an op-ed yeah. that they then title, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, ProPublica misleads its readers. Right. right? <laughs> About a piece that had not been published. About yet. a piece right. that he hadn't even seen yet, where right. he basically just tries to piece together what they were saying and then say that it's a lie. Right. So yeah, we had a situation where the Wall Street Journal was basically like allowing him to run PR, right. like to use them as a PR publishing Absolutely. arm right. yeah. for his office. And that feels relevant here. That's all. And that came in between those two interviews. That's exactly. right. <laughs> right. Exactly. After they did that, they then sat down with him again exactly. right. for another interview. And, and so here's the thing. David Rifkin is a private attorney who yes. has interest before the Supreme Court, who is mm -hmm. named in a brief before the Supreme Court in a case called Moore v. United States, which is about taxing unrealized capital gains. Oh. Hmm. Something that sounds really opaque and doesn't matter to anyone except the people who read the Wall Street Journal. Ultra rich. Who yep. care very much about this sort of thing. Are they going to get rid of unrealized taxes on capital gains? Is that what's happening and more? I'll be investing more aggressively, if so. Uh, <laughs> there are some places that have this stuff and they are really fighting the ability for anybody to tax this. Right. And it's like, Killing a wealth tax before it happens right. Right, is what it is. Right. And to be clear, capital gains is when some asset you own increases in value. Right. Taxing it before it's realized means taxing it before you've like sold the stock, right. et cetera. Before you've liquidated. Right. Turned it into cash. Artwork. Yes. Very rare bottles of wine. <laughs> like, right. like, a horse. All of the classic investments we all make. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Here's the thing, though. <laughs> this structure exists in law everywhere just about everywhere, that has property taxes. If you own a home, they will regularly get reevaluated and you will be taxed based on the new valuation. Right. Even if you haven't sold the home. Right. Even if you haven't realized that gain in asset value, this is normal. My property taxes literally just went up. Yeah, I was going to say, are they going to get rid of property taxes? Because if so, I'm about to get real conservative. All right. <laughs> Trying to buy a home in New Jersey, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something that has existed in American law for a very long time and has been very uncontroversial for a very long time. But the second we've started maybe extending it beyond things that you know apply to the middle class as well mm -hmm. as the wealthy and are like, maybe we should do this same thing with like stocks, bottles of wine, private jets, what have you. We're asking whether or not it's constitutional. And Alito seems to have this very friendly relationship with one of the lawyers right. representing a party in interest here. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Dick Durbin, chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, said he should recuse from the case. Mm -hmm. And he just recently 
wrote a little four page letter saying eat shit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not recusing. He did the whole uh, Wolf of Wall Street. I'm not fucking leaving. <laughs> right. you know, the show goes on. Just because this guy is essentially a business partner of mine. <laughs> right. right. Who manages my PR. Right. Who right. has intertwined his professional career with mine. In the middle of a scandal. And both of our stars rise uh, with the same tide. I know I mix metaphors there. <laughs> that does not mean that I need to recuse. Just because I have kissed this man on the lips as a, as a form of greeting every time I've seen him for the past five years does not mean that I need to recuse. It does not mean we're close. Right. I read the names of those pieces, by the way, the headlines, because I think it's important because one of the big things Alito says is that Rivkin acted as a journalist, not an advocate. Again, Samuel Alito, the Supreme Court's plain spoken defender. It's just a headline. I mean, it's so offensive. Like it's it's actually like, I mean, the way that he did this, even like down to that, like it's an order from the court on the agreement that you don't need to like submit the appendix. Right. right. And he issues this as a statement, as opposed to like when Clarence Thomas on the filings hired an outside lawyer and it like the statement was on the lawyer's website. Mm -hmm. Right. This, he like put it within like Supreme Court font and it's a statement from the justice. Right. Like right. it's yeah. some like formal thing. And yeah. it's right. not just him like having a slap fight with Dick Durbin. Yeah, right. exactly. They're both being political. Yeah. Right. It's so offensive. Right. Yeah. And that's not even getting into the substance, which is also BS. His main problem is that it would look really weird for him to publish his defense of himself in the Wall Street <laughs> Journal, which is what right. he would usually right. do. He doesn't know where else to go. Exactly. His normal PR approach has been <laughs> cut off by circumstances. Exactly. Right. Is he supposed to befriend an entirely separate publication? <laughs> <laughs> but like the, the Washington, Washington Examiner. Examiner. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Free beacon. Right, yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Another little Alito note is just last week, um, or the time this publishes, it'll have been a couple weeks, friend of the podcast, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, lodged an ethics complaint against him, sent it to Chief Justice Roberts. More power to you, Sheldon. But the whole judicial ethics body that has been allowing all of these abuses they're appointed by John Roberts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's yeah. not your uh, friend and ally on these issues. I mean, you like keep sending these guys letters, but unless there's <laughs> in them, I don't think anything's going to change. So I think that's a good point to end on. <laughs> <laughs> Where can people find you, Chris? I have been really appalled by the way that these ethics questions have been responded to by Roberts, by Leto by Thomas, I think that it just shows a complete unwillingness to even address what is plainly in front of all of our faces. So I am continuing to cover that at Law Dork in addition to the actual substance of the cases, in addition to the cases that are, are making their way up. And that's sort of the other area that I, I try to delve into is like, here are things that you're going to be seeing in the next term or two because they are big issues and there are going to be disagreements once we get up to the circuit courts. And so particularly when it comes to LGBTQ issues and criminal justice issues, democracy issues, and uh, sort of the post-Roe landscape. Um, so would encourage people to check out Law Dork. Um, you can just Google away or go to www.lawdork.com. Amazing. Thank you so much for being with us, Chris. This was awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Thank you all. Next week, Hampton v. United States. Case from the 1970s about entrapment. Everyone's always asking us about entrapment. Isn't that entrapment? Doesn't this seem like entrapment? And the answer is always no. And we're going to help explain why. <laughs> That's right. Follow us on social media at 54pod. Go to 54pod.com slash support for subscription options for premium episodes, special events, access to our Slack, all sorts of shit. We'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. 5 to 4 is presented by Prologue Projects. Rachel Ward is our producer. Leon Nafok and Andrew Parsons provide editorial support. 
and our researcher is Jonathan DeBruin. Peter Murphy designed our website, 54pod.com. Our artwork is by Teddy Blanks at Chips NY, and our theme song is by Spatial Relations. <laughs>